continuation of chapter seven, sampling. Um, we had gone over, let's see, is this, there we go. So we've made it through the sampling bowl activity section, the virtual sampling section, and the sampling framework. We just started touching on that. Um, so I've added some learning checks to the earlier section. So we'll look at those as we catch up and then we'll, uh, we'll finish up with what we left, where we left off. All right, so with the sampling bowl, that was just to give us an idea of uh, what a population is and, and what it means to sample and what the mechanism is of sampling and the tool you use to sample and all that stuff. Um, so I won't go through that one, but we do have a learning check for this one. Uh, so the question they pose is why is it important to mix the bowl uh, before we sample the balls? And that's yeah. a good point. And this actually, this principle comes up several times throughout the chapter. Chapter. Did you have an, uh, an idea on that one? Yeah, I think it's, you wanna make sure that it's a random sample. Um, exactly, that was the, the whole thing. Yeah, so that that shaking up the bowl is uh, randomizing the uh, sampling process, yeah. which increases accuracy, as we'll learn. Uh, they use that term, and as we move on, we'll see that term used. But that's directly what it does: is it increases the accuracy of the uh, sample statistics, right? And right, yeah. So why is it that the 33 group of friends did not all have the same number of balls that were uh, red out of 50 and hence different proportions of red? And um, my turn, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, go, with it. I'm gonna go now, Matt. Okay. Last time. So, yeah, in this case, that uh, represented uh, the fact that sampling statistics, point estimates, whatever you call them are, uh, uh, random variables. So you're always going to get a, well, you know, you will tend to get a different value every time you summarize a, a sample. All right, so then we went through virtual sampling. Um, so tactic, uh, what do you call it? Um, tactile sampling was actually physically taking stuff from the bowl. Virtual is now you can do this stuff on your machine. It's the same exact concept, same principles apply. So the learning check for this section was why, uh, so the question is why couldn't we study the effects of sampling variation when we use the virtual shovel only once? Why did we need to take more than one virtual sample in our 30, in our case, 33 virtual samples? Yeah, the answer for this one feels like it's almost in the question. Like you wanna, if you're trying to study sampling variation, like that implies multiple things like multiple samples so that you can actually look at variations. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, if you, if you only, if you only have one sample, there's no variation to study. Um, exactly right. Yeah. Um, I tend to think of it as like your summary of the sample is one observation. If any data set that has one observation, there's, there's no, nothing to analyze. Right. Um, all right, so using different shovels, this was in effect taking larger samples. Um, we have a learning check for this one. And here it says we're using, um, we used shovels to take a thousand samples each. And we computed the resulting, th hey, Pavitra, what's up? Hey, I'm so sorry, guys. We have a bad storm here. So we've been out of power here for some time now. So I, I had to actually borrow someone else's phone and do all kinds of weird things. So, <laughs> but I really wanted to attend this talk, but I'm sorry I'm late. No worries. Oh, no worries. And you're, you haven't really missed anything. Um, we're, okay. just going, we're just perfect. going over what we had gone over last time and I added some learning check. Okay, perfect. Okay, Very please serious. proceed you guys. Thank you. Sweet. Um, all right, so we used uh, shovels to take a thousand samples. We computed the resulting thousand proportions of the shovel, shovel's balls that were red and then visualized the distribution of those thousand proportions in a histogram. We did this for uh, shovels with 25, 50, and 100 slots. And the size, as the size of the shovels increased, the histograms got narrower 
Um, and in other words, as the size of the shovels increased from 25 to 50 to 100, did the thousand proportions A vary less, B vary by the same amount, or C vary more? So did the size of the sample that we were drawing a thousand times uh, make the proportions vary less, vary by the same amount, or vary more? And in this case, because we're taking larger samples, um, it actually makes it vary less. So we're getting more um, precise measurements with larger sample sizes. And then what summary statistic did we use to quantify how much the thousand proportions of red varied? And we'd actually talked about this last time too. Um, and in this case, did we use the inner quartile range? Did we use the standard deviation? Did we use the range of the largest minus the smallest? And yeah, here we use the standard deviation. So we so the standard error is a standard deviation, and we had talked about that um, previous as well. It's an interesting um, point. Okay, so we have the sampling framework. I left out the definitions, and I just listed the terms because um, I was getting tedious typing everything out. But the population is the population we're interested in um, understanding, um, and the Example with the the bowl of balls, the population was the bowl of balls. If it if it's a poll, then it's a population of whatever um, group you're looking to understand their their political preference, right? So, um, population is the uh, group you're looking to understand. The population parameter. This is a um, this is not a random uh, variable. It's if if you have access to the entire population and you measure the uh, the average that's a population parameter and that there's going to be no variance there's, it's it's uh, you will know it if you can measure the entire population so that's a population parameter uh, what's a census the census is when we are able to measure a um, population parameter directly on the entire population then we get to sampling so sampling is a subset of the population whatever you can access um, and a point estimate or a sample statistic, that's a estimate of a population parameter. So if you wanted to take the average um, uh, preference for Democrats and you could measure everyone in the country, that'd be a population parameter. Um, if you couldn't and you just measured a subset of the population, say Orlando, then you'd get a uh, estimate of the average preference for Democrats. Representative sampling, that means that the sample has similar distribution properties to the overall population. Um, in the case of the bowl of balls, um, you would have a similar proportion of red and white balls in the sample. And generalizability, that means that the sample, well, these kind of all go together, right? So if it's a representative sample, then you're um, point estimates, whatever sample statistics you draw from your analysis are generalizable to the broader population. Um, bias sampling, that implies that your sample's not representative for whatever reason. Um, Self-selection, maybe the, like he meant, we mentioned like shaking up the, the bowl of balls to make sure that the distribution was um, um, randomized so you could get in there and get, um, a better estimate of uh, the red and white distribution. So for whatever reason, red were lighter and they were at the top of the bowl, then you're biased towards um, lighter balls. And random sampling, yeah, so that's that principle of um, not having, you're removing bias as much as possible. And you're removing the bias by not doing well, doing as, as, as least amount of um, conditioning on the sampling process as possible, I guess is the uh, idea there, All right? You, you just shake the ball, you just shake the bowl. Well, what is your approach to randomizing your sampling could it be really? So those are the, uh, that's the framework. And how would you summarize this framework to a colleague? 
Yeah, because they kind of put it in English. They put it in, in English nicely. So I was wondering how whoever wants to volunteer, how they'd summarize this framework to a uh, to a colleague who's brave. Yeah, I can take a stab at it. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the way I'd summarize it is like, uh, well, okay, so yeah, I don't think I would get into like, all right, uh, I'll, 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 I guess I'll go this way. So um, if you want to know something about like uh, a population, um, but you don't want to like count every, you don't want to like, uh, basically consider every single person in the population in order to know that thing. Um, you're going to have to take a sample, a subset of the population. Um, and um, that sample needs to be uh, representative of the population that you're trying to study. And it needs to be random, um, which I guess is a part of the representativeness. And um, when you when you take that sample um, and you you calculate you know the thing that you want to know about the population. That's your that's your point estimate, and um, you you know you you want to know if you can basically what that sample estimate tells you. That point estimate tells you about the population, and assuming that you've done your sampling correctly and that your sample size is large enough, um, you can you can kind of infer things about the population from that sample. So that's I guess that's how it's summarizing. Beautiful. Thank you. You're too kind. All right. So now we're going to do a learning check over this uh, terminology and notation section as well as the uh, statistical definition section. So it kind of blurs together. Um, in the case of our bowl activity, what is the population parameter? And do we know its value? So that's a that's the uh, the proportion of red balls for all of the balls in the bowl. And uh, I can't remember if we knew that from the, probably not, but, um, but yeah. Yeah, I think eventually he tells us because he read it off the box. <laughs> That's what he said. He read it off the box of uh, well, the container. But yeah, typically you won't know the value. Um, and in this case we did because yeah, he read it off the box, but it's the, portion of red balls. Um, what would performing a census in our bowl activity correspond to and why didn't we perform a census? Because we have better things to do than count all the balls. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there was like 2,400 and he was taking samples of, well, anyway, it's just hard to count things in general. So yeah, it seems to be hard to do it. Um, and then what purpose do point estimates serve in general? And what is the name of the point estimate specific to our bowl activity? So this is a three-parter. So what is the purpose of uh, point estimates? What uh, was the name of the point estimate specific to our bowl activity? And what is its mathematical notation? Um, I don't, let me jump in. I, well, I don't remember what that is and I can't see because it's uh, dark like I'm in a car. Uh, a point estimate is basically a summary statistic that could be either a mean, a median, a standard deviation, or a variance. So it's it's literally like a summarization of your sample, and it, it is a number with, sorry. Um, so I, but I do not recall what your point estimate was. Great point. Yeah. So to piggyback on that, it's a summary, and and, and so that's the general purpose they serve is to summarize. Um, uh, our best guess about a population parameter. In this specific, specific example, we were looking at the proportion of uh, red balls. And the mathematical notation is a little hat. So for us, it was a hat because it was the proportion. We, set, we labeled it a P and then we put the hat on it to indicate that it's a uh, estimate. And you can actually just wrap things in dollar and put hat and a well, slash hat and wrap up a value and you get a pretty P hat in your R markdown. How fancy is that? Ah, cool. Yeah, oh, I was nice. quite pleased with the finding that. 
All right, so how did we ensure our tactile samples using the shovel were random? This goes back to an earlier point. So how did we make sure that our samples were random from the tactile sampling? Shuffle the bowl. Yeah, we shook that bowl. We shook, shook it up. Bowl. Yeah. Shook it up. All right, why is it important that sampling be done at random? So that you don't have a biased, um, you don't have a biased representation. Um, you want to keep it as random as possible so that it can be as representative of your population. Exactly. And what are we inferring about the bowl based on the samples we took using the shovel? And we've already said this, but this just really kind of drills in, I guess, the core concept. So we're inferring the proportion of red balls. Right. Um, uh. Yeah, so the, that, that's what this, uh, these point estimates or these uh, sample statistics we're doing for us and measuring that red balls, we're getting an inference about what the, the overall proportion of red balls were in that, uh, in that bowl. And what purpose did the sampling district? This is, this is a, an interesting one. Sampling distributions. Yeah, the sampling distributions. What purpose did they serve? Uh, they helped us um, construct a confidence interval, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so the more samples we ran, the more estimates of the proportion of red balls we got. And then we were able to actually analyze the data set with those sample statistics to get all the same analysis we'd use on a regular data set. We got the, the, the expected portion, we got the standard deviation, and the standard deviation of those uh, proportions was the uh, sampling error or confidence interval. Well, I guess the confidence interval would, would uh, be multiple standard deviations. You're looking at that 95%. They didn't actually get in that yet, but we, we do get into we do get to that um, place eventually. Uh, so, is there any connection at all between um, how the standard deviation, how like the the increments of the standard deviation and the confidence interval, like are they in any way tied together, or um, it's it's not really? Um, they are, yeah. So, when you get your ninety five percent confidence interval, it's effectively taking. 1.96. Ah, oh, I see. Deviations. Okay. Yeah, it. and because you're taking a um, a point estimate, and you're taking a bunch of them, and you're taking confidence interval being 1.96 standard deviations um, from the average point estimate, you're able to then get the um, confidence interval for that particular. Um, sample statistic that particular point estimate so you're assuming like a mean zero and then um so then you get the lower and the upper bound is that right well you you don't have to assume that you're um you don't actually have to convert it to a z-score okay the, okay um, confidence interval but okay yeah but it is it is exactly that logic though you're right um, so what's the difference between an accurate and a precise estimate? I love this question because I worked in a lab. Do you want to take this, Matt, or shall I? Go for it. Well, accuracy, okay. <laughs> okay, so precision refers to reproducibility. So you could have answers that are incorrect, but then if you have the incorrect answers repeating for whatever number of times you want to repeat the experiment then that you would be precise you would you would not be correct i mean you would not be accurate but you would be precise accuracy is how close you are to the true value so that is what you uh, want to see and uh, uh, and how close you are to what you are expecting so that that is accuracy whoa you're exactly right i forgot to put in the uh, answer apparently i don't know I, oh, no, I went backwards. There we go. Yeah, so um, that's exactly right. So accuracy is how uh, well the sample represents the population. And then precision is how narrow your standard errors are. And you are not 
they're not guaranteed to um, both work in your favor if you've messed up your sampling process, which this next point gets to. So how do we ensure that an estimate is accurate? And on the flip side, how do we ensure that an estimate is precise? Uh, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go, go for it, Matt. Uh, accuracy we get with um, randomness, um, a random sample, and precision we get with a large sample. But how do we measure it? I think he's he's wanting to know what is the point estimate for that. Oh, no, I didn't mean, I, yeah, I wasn't, I, I meant more generally, like what, what Oh, I see. Accuracy okay, okay. and what drives. Um, gotcha. Uh, okay. But uh, well, but getting back to the question of how we would measure it, would it be standard error? Just just out of curiosity, like would it be the standard deviation, standard error for accuracy? Well, accuracy. It's hard to say with accuracy because you never know what your true. Well, you tend not to know what your true population parameters are, and that's why. Yeah setting up the um, initial sampling process is so important because if you have a biased sample and you don't know it's biased and you've taken a huge sample and you're, you're super precise about your estimates, you're just doing a lot of damage because you, well, I don't know. It just depends on the context, but you, you're, you're, you're off the mark, right? Even, but you're misguided, but you kind of, that you're able to measure precision, right? It's all the confidence interval. That looks really good. It's hard to really know how accurate you're being because the population parameters tend to be unknowns. Um, sure. So it is tricky. That's why they're so tough about randomization and, and trying to make sure that um, if we do make any inferences that we're, we're clear about the generalizability of, of those inferences and, and all that stuff. Is, is that so? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So in a real life situation, we would not take a thousand different samples to infer about a population, but rather only one. Uh, in that case, what's the purpose of our exercise where we took a thousand different samples? I'll do this one. Um, and so I think the purpose there, and you guys can see if the, you can tell me if this was on the mark or not, but I think the purpose there was that uh, uh, to demonstrate sample statistics are random variables, right? To have people go in and take samples over and over again, different people, and, and to see how their point of estimates varied. It just kind of drove home the point, at least to me, that, wow, this sampling process and these estimates we're creating, they really are random. I mean, the more you take, the, the more normal the randomness is, but still, still. Right. 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 So we're on polling. So this is the learning check for case study polls. I, I, I just doubled down on, on learning checks, apparently. I forgot, I put this together over the weekend. All right, so right. come on the representativeness of the following sampling methodologies. Okay, so we've got the, so, so in this section, we're gonna talk, about, we're gonna actually kind of critique some um, sampling methodologies to determine how point estimates would be based on our analysis. So the Royal Air Force wants to study how resistant all their airplanes are to bullets. So they're studying the bullet holes on all the airplanes on the tarmac after an air battle against the Luftwaffe, which is the German Air Force. Yeah, that's no good. It doesn't sound good. Does Survi Why not? Survivor bias. Survivor bias. Right? Survivor bias. Yeah. Uh, the samples bias to airplanes that weren't shot down. Survivor bias. Um, right. Yeah, tricky stuff. Uh, so imagine it's 1993, a time when almost all have landlines. You want to know the average number of people in each household in your city. You randomly pick out 500 phone numbers from the phone book and conduct a phone survey. What about this one? 
Representative, what are? Well, the, the, so two problems with this. One, you would have effectively discounted the people that do not have phones who are probably in the not so, I mean, I, that's hard to say in, in the United States, but that's true in, in other countries that they may not have phones. And secondly, the working population could actually may not be home at that time. So you might miss like a large percentage of people who you're trying to poll. Um, let's see. Um, I thought it was okay, but <laughs> I, I didn't see, uh, I, I, I see your points though. Pavitra, yeah. Um, I, I guess because they said almost all households had landlines, I just gave them that, um, gave See, them the because, point. Specifically because it's a landline and not a mobile number, a mobile phone, I feel like the working, the people that work at that time, like, do, do they give you like different time slots when they call so that they can accommodate the ones who are outside the house at that time? Yeah, you'd have to, I guess, yeah, you're right. You'd have to take all these considerations and to make sure you're not um, but I mean, and that's the reason why call in, like when people call in for polls, like you know, when they're trying to get a like a representation of like um, what, what your 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 you know your constant like your uh, county or whatever is it like red or is it blue? Like when you're trying to determine that, like this was one of the biggest problems they had with the the calling people and figuring out, you know, because of the fact that you are missing out a large percentage of the population who are just not available for your you know to answer your questions during those times yeah and i mean there were a few other really good things i remember now i think it's called how charts lie or something i don't know who it's by maybe alberto cairo or it's a really good book by some by a statistician called how charts lie uh and in fact i was strongly going to suggest that we uh be like after we finish this book that we actually do like a book club with one of those books like uh how charts lie or whatever, just because it tells you all, like now getting our knowledge now about graphs and like data, like I think that it would be a really great way to see how it's actually, you know, misused and misinterpreted. So like, okay, anyway, that, uh, I, I digress. But I remember this in particular had been brought about as being a problematic exactly for this purpose that you missed a large percentage of. Yeah, and there's a book, uh, Lot and if you can set Statistics. statistics. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, here's another one to critique. We want to know the prevalence of illegal downloading of TV shows among students at a local college. Now we get the emails of 100 randomly chosen students and ask them, how many times did you download a pirated TV show last week? What's wrong with this one? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Like, I'm, like anyone's going to come out and say, hey, yeah, me pirated and wow. Yeah, you're probably measuring something else. Like, I'm measuring uh, proportion of people who are that, willing to admit. Yeah, that's how I looked at it. I was like, okay, you're looking at like some psychological condition where they're like willing to flagrant yeah. admit it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're probably not going to get a um, a true sample of what's going on there. Uh, just because people aren't as willing to talk about it. Um, we got another one. This one says a local college administrator wants to know the average income of all graduates in the last 10 years. All right, so they want to know the average income. They get the records of five randomly chosen graduates, contact them, and obtain their answers. So they're five for five. What's the critique of this sampling? Awesome. So wait, when did they graduate? Ten years ago, is that right? La the last ten years. So it sounds like within the last ten years, if you graduated, you were you're you're part of the population I'm interested in to understand you. I've selected five of you randomly. I've contacted them, and uh, I've gotten their answers. And now I've got my idea of of what you guys make. Well, five out of a graduating class of what? Like, what is that number? Right, I can't, so just understanding what we understand about schools, it seems like a fraction, like a, a fraction of graduates, unless this is like the smallest school ever. 
yeah i mean first of all that is not very representative and b what are the chances that 10 years from now people have not moved or changed professions or had sort of a midlife career crisis and like maybe restarted school or something like that so how would you draw your conclusion based on on that like i mean i feel like 10 years is too long a period i don't know what do you think matt uh yeah i mean that is a long time um they get the records yeah so i i guess assume, i was kind of assuming that they were able to get a hold of them um but but you're right i mean if they can't get a hold of them then it's problematic if they can get a hold of them then i mean this is a random sample it's just small um yeah like so like the precision would be okay no the accuracy would be okay representative potentially um, theoretically. Yeah, assuming they, they could actually contact them tip of each response. Yeah, but the precision, right? Because it's five. I mean, you're, you're so likely to miss the mark wildly. Like, I'd be shocked if you had even... Well, even accuracy, guys. I mean, think about it. What if you pick five people from, I'm, let's say that you conduct this in New York City and all of your five are like, whatever, they're working at Wall Street, but then what about the others that went you know, like just went to other parts of the country and like that's so like, I think non-representative of, of, of a class of like graduating class of 200 kids at least, you know? I, I feel yeah, like I even I suffer. Yeah, yeah, you gotta, you gotta get more samples, man. <laughs> and that was it. Oh, nice. Well, that's it for the sampling chapter. So the big ideas, I mean, we, we hit on the framework, I think, is very uh, concise, populations, uh, population estimates, samples, sample statistics. Your sample nice. to get a better, uh, more accurate look at your population. Bigger samples to get more precise estimates in your own business. Very nice, very well done, Eric. It's uh, very engaging. I really liked how you picked the learning uh, aspects of this and really made it a thinking, uh, like it was a really good thinking session. Yeah, that's what I was going for. I was going for a thinking session. Get us working through these learning checks. Yeah, um, and so I recall that Matt said something about simulation. So I was just wondering where you guys saw that because I'm really curious. I did not know that such a thing existed with modern dive. So like, can you direct me as to where I can actually see these simulations of the central limit theorem and the others? I think it's the next chapter. Uh, well, there is a... Oh, okay. and... It was not this. I think there's a... At the end of this chapter, there's a... Uh, yeah, under conclusion, um, and then so section 7.5.2, there is a three minute um, video on the central limit theorem. Um, I think that's what I was referring to. Like, I don't know if I'd say okay, so it is in the chapter, like, you should be able to link to it from the chapter then. Yeah, like, I mean, we could, we have a little bit of time, like, we could watch it now really quickly. Um, Eric, I don't know if you want to pull it up, but. Let's do it. I'm going to pop it up right now. Yeah. I'm going to put it are in. Are you um, able to participate in that, Pavitra, or are well, you? I'm gonna uh... pull in, well, I'm going to pull into a parking lot because I, uh, I am driving, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't want to kill you. It's not causing. Well, I know. I mean, the problem is I didn't have power at my house and I have been waiting for this session uh, for like the whole week. And so I ended up having to go to a friend's house, but I had to do and right now I'm doing it on a phone. So it's, but whatever. Uh, anyway, I didn't miss it. So I'm happy. Uh, hang on, you guys. I just pulled into a Tom Tom parking lot. So I'm safe and I will not die during this process. All right. That'd be too traumatic. <laughs> That's right. Oh, she died during the sampling chapter. What a interesting the video on bunnies, dragons, and the normal world. <laughs> That's right. Give me the green light and I'll uh I'll start playing it. Cool. Are we ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Can everyone see it? 
Yes. Okay. Yep. I can't really hear it. Yeah, we can't hear anything though. Okay, let's see. What can I do? Is there a way to pipe in the audio? You know, sometimes well, if you're doing a Zoom share, it can mess up your, unless you're, I mean, you may want to check your audio or speaker settings or whatever, like on your thing. Uh, it's messed up mine before. So you may, or you could play it on your, you could do the video on your laptop and play it on your phone if you think that that'll pick up the volume there. Of course, you'll have to synchronize them though. Let's see here. <laughs> All right, so if I go to share, I wonder if I target just the YouTube. Uh, share computer sound, look at that. Oh, I didn't know there was such an option. All right, let's check this out. And he will notice that most of the rabbits are- okay. Is that right. working? All yeah. right. All right, so uh, start with our cue. Somewhere in the fields, a brave ecologist is studying <laughs> wild. He plans to record the weights of every single rabbit. If he follows this plan, he will notice that most of the rabbits are close to the average and that there are some rabbits, but not many, that are much larger or much smaller than the average. The further from the average you get, the fewer animals there are. This particular bell-shaped curve is called a normal distribution. Sadly, he has to give up his experiment for it will cost him a fortune in carrots to complete it. So, he changes the plan. Instead of measuring every rabbit in the whole group, he decides to measure rabbits in small groups, chosen at random from the whole group. He knows that each small group won't necessarily be perfectly representative of the whole group. So he measures many small groups and then compares the averages of each. He starts by weighing five rabbits at a time, and he finds that the distribution of the average is somewhat bell-shaped. Then, he increases the sample size by weighing 20 rabbits at a time, and then 100 rabbits at a time. Surprisingly, as the sample size increases, the spread decreases. The distributions of average weights becomes more and more normal. What our brave ecologist has just demonstrated is the central limit theorem. The averages of samples have approximately normal distributions. If the sample size increases, this distribution of averages becomes more normal and narrower. What if the population distribution is not normal to begin with? For example, the distribution of dragon wingspan is known to be bimodal. If an even braver ecologist were to study wild dragons, and measure dragon wingspans, the distribution of the average wingspan would still be approximately normal. And again, the more dragons our brave ecologist could measure at a time, the closer the distribution of their average wingspans will be to a truly normal distribution. The distribution will also be narrower. So now we know that regardless of a true distribution, the central limit theorem shows that the average of values drawn from the distribution will always be approximately normal. Furthermore, the bigger the sample size, the narrower the distribution of average becomes. And the closer the mean of the sample gets to the true mean of the population. This is why sample size matters so much in any statistical analysis, whether it is a political poll or evaluation of a medical procedure. There is something very special about the normal distribution. Not only do many things we measure in biology follow a normal distribution, but it also crops up when we look at estimates of variables, even when the variables themselves don't have a normal distribution, as we saw with dragon wings. Because of this, we can use the normal distribution to test ideas about the world even when the underlying variables don't follow a normal distribution. My name is Puthikrit Patacharya. This video was created by Shui Cho and brought to you by CreatureCast. Special thanks to Casey Dunn. For more stories, visit CreatureCast. There we have I it. I think he makes it.
Yeah, that was really cool. I think he makes a valid point there that even if you are underlying distribution of your variables themselves are not normal, they will, I mean, I mean, this is so true, isn't it? That it could come from a distribution that's not normal, but it still follows the central limit, the paradigm of cent the central limit theorem. So like, like, I guess he was trying to pinpoint some constellations or something, which didn't, like, they were kind of, I don't know, like, what, what was it exactly like, uh, what was he trying to say with that? Uh, with the, hmm. well, if you're, at, so towards the end, do you recall how he said if you're, if what you're observing itself doesn't come from an underlying normal distribution, right. even if, even if that's not the case, then it would, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I was a little bit confused about that. Yeah, he said the, the, you talk about the example of bimodal. So the the dragon wings are are bimodal of the the wingspan, but no, 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 not that part. Um, actually, uh, let's see. If I can pull it up. Uh, one second. I'm gonna try and see if I can. I was looking everywhere to stop sharing. I couldn't figure it out. There we go. <laughs> Uh, okay. yeah, on that video, really nice summary of a lot of the core principles. Yeah, so I guess the one of the on the the bimodal, and you're getting a precise estimate of a of a, of a single. No, oh, have, just just so we know, we have less than a minute here. We're about to get booted because we're at the yeah, we're doing. yeah. Cool. So I guess I guess we should wrap before we abruptly Wait. get kicked. Yes. All right. Well, this is fun. Thank for thank you for putting this together, Eric. Yeah, it's really pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure's all mine. All right. Well, next week, I think. Um, yeah, I was. I picked. Week, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I've been dying, dying to try out that infer package. So I'm really looking forward to that because I've heard really awesome things about it. It's a